Coastal. So my name is Sarah Gladue. I'm the Director of Education and Citizen Science for Coastal Rivers. And I thought about doing this program because I've been doing some late, Lake Smart programming. Uh, and I actually would like to um, kind of enlarge it to include marine environment as well, because certainly all of our water <laughs> is connected. And um, so, the, you know, we, we would benefit by having clean, fresh water that runs into clean salt water and so forth. Hi, Sarah, welcome. Um, Hi, Sarah, thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, sure, glad you could join us. We're just getting started. And I was just Good. saying, I, I, um, I thought about doing this program because I'm, I'm doing some Lake Smart programming. And Lake Smart is a program that is voluntary um, and it's education focused. Uh, and what we do is we provide homeowners and property owners with information about um, how to make sure that what they're doing on their landscape is not contributing to any water quality issues. And so um, we look at a variety of things and include, you know, we look at the, the runoff from the house and the runoff from the driveway and the septic system and um, the, the buffer itself and all sorts of things. And one of the things that comes back time and time again are questions about the buffer, like, you know, what, what's a good buffer? How do, how do I know it when I see it? Um, and, and how do I make one? So that's why I thought that maybe just having conversation with folks about this to get us started would help. And certainly um, anything you do to, you know, if, if, if you've got some runoff issues on your driveway, um, you know, you, you fix what you can. Um, and, and anything you do, every piece of it is going to help in terms of the overall water quality issues um, in, in your area. So, um, let's see. So I'm gonna go to start playing my, my slides here. This is a view, actually this picture is from um, Pemiquid, Pemiquid Lake, uh, right from the boat landing off of, in Nobleboro. So, um, you know, what causes erosion? And there's a huge number of, <laughs> of sources of erosion that really contribute to land moving around. Um, and, oh, and welcome, Peggy. We're, we've just gotten started, so. Thank you. Glad you could join us. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of, this picture is a little ridiculous, but, but I've seen it all. And, um, you know, gravity is real <laughs> and water runs downhill is a real thing. And um, they all contribute. Um, and, and ice and frost have, have big impacts on the landscape, of course. Um, this is an image of soil creep where you have, um, you know, not enough vegetation to hold the incline, um, in place and so it's the soil is literally creeping over the bedrock and you've probably seen leaning gravestones and tilted fences and things like that um the trees the inset with the trees being bent um is literally because the, the tree is was growing in one spot and it tries to grow straight up towards the light and the and yet the soil beneath it's continuously moving in this case so um, and we'll talk about slumping and some of these other things that, that we see. But um, there's a lot, I guess, is what my point is, um, when you're talking about counteracting some of the, some of the uh, impacts of erosion. And erosion um, is, is sediment that's moving. And sediment moving into the water is the number one source of water pollution worldwide. And it's, um, it's an issue because it carries sometimes pollution that it encounters. Uh, so it might be, you know, nickel or cadmium from tailpipes of vehicles. It can uh, carry phosphorus and nitrogen, which um, could be fertilizers on lawns, for example. It can um, literally enter the water and block out light so that the plants that are growing in the column of water don't have access to the light they need and, and they suffer from it. Um, and overall, this is this term for what, when you have a depletion of oxygen um, 
partly from the blocked sunlight killing plants and partly from algae blooms that are being consumed by bacteria. This is called eutrophication. And um, so you have a loss of habitat and, and a loss of oxygen production. And you can result in things like fish kills and things like that. So that's why we're concerned. We don't want to see this sort of thing. We don't even want to see anything like it in our lakes and in our embayments um, in the marine waters. It's less likely in some of these tidal areas, but in, in terms of like a fish kill like this, but it is, it does happen. And um, it depends on how the flush, what the flushing rate of that area is. And sometimes you have embayments that are really, that are really constrained and um, don't flush too regularly. And sometimes you do. So there's some variability there. Uh, and the, the, the sediment entering the water, whether it's a marine environment or a freshwater environment, it, it doesn't really, it, it can, because it carries stuff with it, um, it still poses a, a, a problem, uh, no matter which, which variety of environment it is. Oops, how did I do that? <laughs> so the question is, you know, do I need a buffer? Um, what is a buffer and, how, and do I need it? Well, so the, the goal with the buffer is that it's um, going to be um, either planted or a hard surface that protects the bank and the shore from the energy that's created um, from the waves and wake. And it protects the water uh, from the human activity in addition. So, you know, it's stopping the sediment from running down the hill or running across the lawn and entering the waterway. It's appropriate for any body of water, big or small, fresh or marine. It's appropriate for steep and shallowly inclined banks because um, the, the water always is going somewhere. And if it's not percolating into the soil, uh, either because the soil is very compact or because there's nothing taking it up, then it eventually will travel um, down the bank into the waterway and, and it has the potential to cause erosion and every bit counts. So a lot of times people ask me, well, you know, maybe I should just put some rocks in the, in the bank. I should get some riprap. I should create a hard surface of some kind. And so one of the things I like to talk about early on here is, you know, why vegetation? Why are we talking about a vegetated? When I talk about buffers, I'm, I'm primarily talking about a vegetated um, buffer area. And it's because hard surfaces don't solve problems as a general rule because the energy that is from the waves, the movement of the water, even raindrops uh, flowing, you know, sheets of rain coming over the landscape, they, that water has, uh, sorry, that energy has to go somewhere. And so it dissipates and sometimes it dissipates downward as that diagram is showing. And then you get, um, you know, when, when the energy of the wave hits that hard surface of the wall, I don't know if you all can see my cursor here, hopefully um, you can, but the water come, he, comes here, hits this wall, and it, the energy is, is being driven down and driven up. And that's why you, a lot of times you see the wave, you'll see a splash. Well, some of the water is getting tossed up in the air, and the equal amount of energy is going down in, into, the, into the, the benthic environment, the bottom of the, of the water column there. And it's scraping out this area. And so plants can't grow and sediment is getting moved around and um, it's not solving the problem of, of um, uh, eutrophication because it's, it's disturbing the bottom too much and the energy is not dissipating. Uh, there's nothing breaking the energy there. And so this photograph with the wall, you know, we have the lawn, the wall, the splash zone is coming right up over the wall. And what happens in a situation like this is this guy's lawn is protected in a sense because they've got the hard barrier, but this guy's lawn where there's tall grass and a tree and uh, that's some equipment there um, is getting, is getting um, badly eroded and it's, it's, there's a washout right here underneath the bank. And so you 
you pose the problem to your neighbor, either your own property, if, if you're putting up a hard surface, um, and then sort of to the left and the right of that hard surface are gonna get eroded. Uh, and you risk also your neighbor's property, potentially if the energy is just getting transferred um, north or south or east or west uh, up and down the bank. So it doesn't you generally solve the problem. We'll talk about riprap in a few minutes, um, which are big sort of cobblestone type rock size, fist size rocks um, as, a, as, as sometimes an alternative, but um, in general, these hard surfaces pose real problems. And in fact, that's why um, in the marine environment, basically, you know, some of the um, towns and so forth have in the past put up um, hard, hard uh, wave breaking surfaces. And now it's, it's pretty much illegal, illegal for the most part. Um, <coughs> ah, well, I seem to be having trouble with my, there we go. So there's, there's two most destructive causes of accelerated erosion. And so when, when we talk about erosion, you know, people say, well, you know, erosion is natural and that's true. It is natural, but you can also have accelerated erosion. And so, um, when you have accelerated erosion, you're losing, you're losing property potentially, and certainly you're impacting water quality. So the removal of native vegetation, land and aquatic, so both the water, the, the, the plants that are growing out of the water and, emer and emerging from the surface of the water, those, um, if those are removed, and also the hardening of the shoreline, those are the most destructive causes of accelerated erosion. And this image is on the right here is to show you the little bit of the difference. You know, if you've got turf, <laughs> your basic lawn, that's the relative size. You know, what you see above the land, what you see above the green part is essentially the same in terms of what the height of that lawn is, the height of the length of those roots going down. And so the roots on that fescue turf are tiny compared to the potential you know, here's a daylily or some spirea. Uh, we have a native spirea, that's a shrub um, called meadow sweet, you know. And so you take a shrub and you've got equal, <laughs> equal biomass below the surface of the ground, essentially that you've got for root structure that can be holding the bank in place. Um, and we have a little phrase, lakes like less lawn. And that's what the buffer is all about is, is replacing some of the lawn um, with with a buffer area. Oops, I don't know what I'm doing that's making it do that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so how does a buffer work? What you know, what what's what are the basics behind how we install the buffer or um, retain a buffer? And the basic idea with the buffer is that you want a tree canopy that's going to have um, leaves and needles that intercept the raindrops and so they're reducing the impact on the soil just by slowing the raindrops and um, lessening the the total volume in fact as well. The leaf surfaces are collecting rain and allowing evaporation. The low plants and the duff layer are filtering sediment and pollutants and keeping them from the from the water body itself. So they're actually filtering out absorbing some of that water and the root systems are holding the soil in place and absorbing the water and the nutrients. It's important to have uneven soil surfaces with hummocks and depressions that will allow the rain and the snow melt to puddle and infiltrate. So if you have a buffer area, and when I say buffer area, I'm saying, you know, sort of between the recreation area, um, the livable, the more, the more heavily used human area, it might be the house itself, like in this picture, these folks have a house that was built um, in the 1960s, I believe, and it's fairly close to the water. Um, and this is their buffer. So it's the livable space to the edge of the water, and this is their buffer. This happens to be a very native, natural buffer. Um, she doesn't, she doesn't um, sort of tend it at all. It's not a garden style buffer, but this is a natural. So she's got some low shrubs and she's got, there's quite a bit of moss in this buffer area. Um, they have pine trees that are growing right on the shores of the lake. This is um, 
one of the big ponds. I forget which one it is now. But at any rate, um, duck puddle, I guess. I guess this is a duck puddle pond. Um, so that's how a buffer works. It's, it's allowing the rain to evaporate and infiltrate and be absorbed um, and any runoff, same thing. So how do I know a good buffer when I see one? This is an image of the Nobleboro town landing right off of Route 1. And um, the, the idea behind a buffer is that um, you want to have you know, trees and shrubs and herbaceous plants. You want to have multiple layers, in general, at least three layers. So you have the duff, which in this case is um, some mulch and probably some pine needles mixed in. It's got some herbaceous plants here. Um, but this is really only probably, you know, a few feet back and then, and then there's nothing here. And actually there's a, there's a road surface. There's an entryway here. There's a driveway. Um, so, so this is missing, you know, the minimum you're supposed to have 10 feet of vegetated surface um, back from the, from the water's edge. And um, the ground should be uneven, which this one is, so that there are depressions um, that can be used for, for puddling and infiltration during high runoff periods. Um, there should be no visible straight channels, which there are not here. Um, there should be no places where, you know, coming off the hillside, you see rills run, run off, you know, over time that's, that's collecting into, into channels and running down into the lake. Um, and if you do see that, then you look to, well, how can I correct that? How can I correct that with vegetation, with the duff layer that's the, you know, it can be, the duff can be needles and leaves that you just haven't raked up. Um, it can be heavy mulch that doesn't get moved by rain. Um, all those things will help to help promote the infiltration. Um, and then a note about native plants. I'm going to talk a little bit more about native plants than I am about other plants, non-native plants, but they do require less maintenance in general, um, depending on how you're maintaining them. You, you can put a lot of work into them as well. Um, and they are going to generally require fewer herbicides and pesticides because they have their own ways of um, combating whatever insects and so forth that live in the area that might might be attacking them. They're going to be generally better for pollinators and other wildlife. And um, so we do promote the use of natives. And a lot of times people say, well, they're going to put their natives down along the, in the buffer area, along the shore. Um, and then, and when they want to have more cultivated varieties of plants, they do this up near the house. So um, that seems to be a good way to think about it for some folks. So feel free to chime in or make observations as we go along. Um, but here's a few first steps that you could consider for building a better buffer. Um, for one thing, it, you know, if you are wanting to try it out, but you don't really know, you know, how wide can I make my buffer? We know wider is better. The wider your buffer, the more infiltration is going to happen, the more the water quality is going to be protected, um, and the less erosion you're going to see over time. Um, and if you do lose a tree, for example, if you have a wide buffer, you're going to have plants that can presumably come in and take over that area um, potentially as well. So one way to just create the buffer, let it be natural to begin with, um, and try it out is to stop mowing that buffer area. I see a, a lot of areas along the shore um, being mowed. And if you don't mow it, all of a sudden you've got a buffer. If you've got knee-high grass and goldenrod and um, other native plants growing, you know, um, milkweeds, for example, and things like that, then all of a sudden you've gone from roots that are infiltrating into the dirt two inches at the most to two feet um, just by stopping the mowing and allowing plants to start growing in that area. So um, you want to plan for three layers of the buffer, the duff, 
the knee high plants and the tall plants. And you want the tall plants, the tallest plants need to form a canopy. Um, and that can, the more complete the canopy is, the better your root system is going to be. In general, not always, but in general, when you look at a tree uh, and you look at the spread of its, of its um, branches, that's about as far as the roots are spreading as well. So if you look at a big spreading oak tree um, that's 85 years old and it's along the shore, well, you can get a pretty good sense of just how far those roots are spreading and how much of an area that tree is able to contribute erosion protection. Um, one good way to just kind of start right away is stop raking needles and leaves, they'll form a duff and they'll slow run off. And if you can do this, at least in the buffer area, great. If you can do it in, there may be a, an area that's sort of between the lawn or the lived in area, the recreation area, let's say, and the buffer itself. Um, if you can stop raking those as well, then so much the better. Um, everybody has a different idea of aesthetics. So that that's great and fine. Um, but I think people just need to know the importance of um, what is there naturally so they can use it if they're, if they're able. Um, and then if you've got an area where you can see that maybe the water is sheeting over the surface of the land, um, maybe a bare spot where, um, I don't know, there's been some disturbance, for example, you know, add mulch to that area. Um, if there's no leaves, if you don't have canopy that's contributing leaves and needles. And um, there are different grades of mulch. So you need to talk to somebody about finding one where the mulch is heavy enough that it's not going to be um, eroding. And talk to the, whoever you're purchasing it from about uh, also finding mulch that's suited to your slope. So if you've got a really steep slope and you have a lot of water coming down that slope, you're going to need a very heavy grade of mulch as compared to somebody who's just dealing with a flat surface. Um, I did stick a few extra pictures in here throughout the presentation of this is this is bunch bunchberry. It's a native ground cover. Um, it's a dogwood actually. It's just very it's very very it's only five inches tall. Lovely flowers in the early spring and later on um, in the summer pretty berries. So. So uh, uh, one feature that you could consider in your buffer, um, adjacent to your buffer as part of your buffer, um, is where you do have depression, sometimes people have a low spot and you might be able to create a rain garden where you've got you know, um, an area that really requires specialized plants that can survive having their roots wet. And so you can actually facilitate that um, by either digging it out more, um, you know, kind of grading it so that it's it's actually, rather than having the water running over the landscape, you could create a, a depression that has um, some aesthetic value, plants that you like, um, but is also promoting the infiltration that would naturally happen in that depression, rather than letting that water um, that's collecting there um, just keep running on down the hillside. So um, it does require some preparation sometimes. I mean, sometimes you can use what's there and you don't have to do too much. It depends sort of on how, what your gardening technique is, what, what you like aesthetically as well. Um, sometimes you can select some native plants and stick them in a wet spot and they're gonna do fine and you don't have to do too much. Other times, you know, you want a more cultivated look and so you're gonna choose plants that maybe, um, that maybe grow in a particular way and, mm -hmm. um, and you might need to do some more preparation of the garden bed itself in that case. Uh, so that middle picture is just showing you, you know, this is just one way to cut, there was a depression there, but they, they kind of um, enhanced it and enhanced it with mulch and actually put gravel underneath so that there'd be um, sort of space for the water to collect and then soil on top and they're selecting plants that will grow in that environment. And, that happ happens to be right where the, there's runoff from the house. Um, and I, I don't remember if it's like a uh, gutter or something like that. Maybe that there's gutter. That's common. I've seen that in a lot of places where you have a depression collecting water from a gutter and that's a good place for a rain garden. That's, that's a brilliant idea. I've never thought about that. I just, yeah. yeah. 
it's not my idea. I can't take any credit. I don't know who thought of this idea, but it is promoted in the literature as a good way to, you know, make use of something that's naturally there and, and yeah. enhance the aesthetic value of your property as well. So pathways um, through the buffer, you know, cause are, are a specific issue. Um, Lake Smart literature says that you need to be, you know, I can't remember what the what the exact distance is, but it's, you know, fairly narrow for one person to walk is generally the idea. Um, and so, um, but the generally people have a pathway going down to the shore to the dock and it can create some issues because then you have either, you know, you have a packed down area and it, um, it may have water that runs like on those steps on that one side um, where the, all the erosion is. The, the water is just running around the side of the steps and causing all kinds of havoc there. Um, and so, um, and in the middle picture, you've got, that's more of a, of a camp road or a house driveway kind of situation. It's not really a path, but the same idea um, can be taken from this middle picture, which is that, you may need to um, install some kind of a way to reroute the water that's coming down the bank. A lot of times your buffer is at an incline, generally speaking, there's some incline down to the water's edge. Um, and then, so let me start um, kind of with the, with the path itself. It should be no wider than necessary um, for the uses that you have. Um, sometimes people do carry boats and things up and down the path. That might need to be a little wider, but um, curving it will help because then you've got a curved pathway where water is naturally deflected off the side of the path as opposed to a straight shot down to the lake. Um, so you want to not have straight shot to the lake because you don't want the water just running straight down and having no chance to inf infiltrate where if you create a winding path. I couldn't find a really excellent picture. I need to I need to take some more pictures myself, but um, I tried to find a good picture of, of a path that was, you know, winding, narrow, um, and had some type of water bar like this middle image has where this is, you know, you can see the erosion that's happening on the top of the driveway. So the water runs down here, down the top of the driveway. It hits this water bar, which is um, either a piece of wood or it can also be, um, a strip of uh, heavy duty rubber, which is, um, that can pose a problem in a situation where you are, um, where you're plowing on a driveway. Of course, on a path, it's less of an issue. There is a different solution for a driveway where you're plowing that I could talk about if you're curious. But at any rate, the water comes down and it runs sideways instead of just continuing down the hill, gathering speed, energy, sediment, and into either their basement or headed off into the lake, um, the, the water is taken off um, to the side of the, of the path or the driveway, whichever, um, by this water bar. And then you create some kind of infiltration area where you've got a hole there or a ditch deep enough to let the water infiltrate. They have packed it with stones, it looks like, so that they don't have erosion um, right at that location. Um, and, and that button probably is necessary to be able to, and that you could plant into that potentially as well, depending on how much water is collecting there and how long it's retained. So your path um, down to the lake through your buffer, uh, if you've got areas that are washing out, um, you may want to install some kind of diver a diverter and it could literally be a piece of wood that's sort of dug into the ground could be a piece of rubber and you can create either just an area where there's lots of plants that are soaking that up pretty readily or an actual um, containment system mm -hmm. and then um, the the path itself should have a stable and infiltrating surface so um, here we've got infiltration steps where this is like pea gravel that's been set into these um, into this walkway and so um, the the pea gravel is allowing water just to infiltrate and they are having some runoff issues either already or in the past along the side here 
um, of these infiltrations. So this is where you would definitely want to do um, heavy mulching, uh, probably also with, with planting as well um, in an area like this. So, you know, this looks like pine trees. They've obviously got lots of needles. So when you've got acidic soil like that, <laughs> sorry, um, you know, you're gonna have to be very selective about what plants can grow there, but certainly blueberries, um, certainly huckleberries are happy in that environment um, and ground cover like partridge berry can do well there. You can get ideas by just walking in the woods and looking under the pine trees and seeing what's growing under there um, and, and figuring out, you know, what, what else likes to live. These actually look like they, it's, you know, I'm not sure, but it could be huckleberries and so forth growing underneath already. And so you just need to, in this case, promoting some of the growth of those plants as well. Um, using the diverters like, like this is, and infiltration steps um, may be necessary on steep paths. Certainly this steep path needs something. Um, infiltration steps would be a start and then establishing better vegetation um, and, um, and probably also needing to divert the water as it comes down the hill so that it's not just collecting faster and faster, more and more. Do folks, do you all have your own um, kind of pathways that go down through your buffer currently? Is that something you already have? Where my access to the water is a, at a steep part of the bank and I actually have a wooden stairway built there. And, and how is the run, is the runoff a problem or is it pretty good or at that point um it's not an issue i don't believe that part of the bank seems to be okay mm. is it because of vegetation or some other reason uh vegetation yeah it seems yeah. to be a pretty good at that particular point nice that's great so whoops we already did that um in preparation for doing plantings, you do need to be aware of the Mandatory Shoreline Zoning Act before you do any clearing. Um, and so sometimes people want to clear in order to create a garden type area or a, um, you know, a new, they want to open up some place in order to plant different plants. And in some cases, it's better not to do that. Um, it's in general, it's better to take what you already have um, on your bank and not remove that vegetation and work around it. Um, so there is a lot of regulation around this. It can be quite confusing. Code enforcement officers should um, be able to help you interpret it. Sometimes they are confused if there seems to be lack of clarity. I do recommend you talk to the Department of Environmental Protection. They have lots of folks um, who are very clear about the rules. Um, this is an abbreviated summary that I put on here. Uh, some municipalities are more restrictive than what the state um, has. So you also need to be aware of whatever municipal regulations are in place. Um, and so, um, Anyway, so, and, and that's the case really any, anywhere in the shoreland zone. Um, but I think a lot of people, you know, assume they're just gonna be able to empty out what's there and recreate something um, that is a buffer that's more either aesthetically appealing or um, um, in line with, with what they want in that particular area. And sometimes it's, it's not a good idea. Um, one of the tools that folks may want to consider is riprap, um, which is this, you know, heavy chunks of granite, sort of it's the size of your fist on up a little bit. Um, when you have a real issue with erosion that's already underway and um, the bank needs to be fairly quickly sta stabilized, like you're going to lose the big tree that's right in that vicinity, for example. Um, or there's a piece of property that you're going to lose, a dock or house or boathouse or something, you know. Um, you may need to quickly 
um, maintain that that bank as, as fast as you can. And um, so in general, hard surfaces are not useful, but when, when you've got a, a real problem, sometimes riprap can help stabilize a bank. Um, and it can be combined with planting, and it should be, because the, pl the plants themselves will help to dissipate the energy of the waves um, if, if that's at all possible. It also needs to be installed properly. I'm certainly not um, an expert on that, and so you just need to find somebody. There are a number of folks who are listed on the main DEP website who are um, certified to provide um, Lake Smart, uh, uh, what's the word, Lake Smart approved <laughs> uh, types of work. And so um, you want to find somebody who's done this before and who understands how to, the, the riprap needs to be not only on the bank itself, but there needs to be an apron over the top and underneath um, otherwise, you're just going to end up with water working its way underneath or additional erosion happening over the, sur the top of the surface area. Um, sometimes fabric is used and sometimes not. And so, um, uh, and I actually don't know fully the reasons for that, but it's something that might need to consider. And then juniper is a native ground cover um, in evergreen that is a great uh, plant to to put into riprap or if you've got a lot of rocky outcroppings and so forth along the bank and you're having trouble getting other things to take hold there um, it's it's not great for walking through it's a little prickly so you might not want it along the path but it is a it's a good plant in a lot of other regards with respect to um, and it actually, it, the other thing is that it does well in the marine environment. Um, so, you know, on the shores of the estuary, it will do fine. And it doesn't seem to mind the, the salty, the saltiness and so forth to some extent. So, riprap does um, generally require perm by rule. And so this is a, um, a permitting process that you need to check with your code enforcement officer or the main DP uh, before installing and any, any contractor would would tell you that, I would hope, would tell you that, but um, uh, because it is a shoreline zone um, and it is a hard surface, so. So in terms of the plantings themselves, um, some things to think about. So first of all, knowing your site, your, your, your soil hardiness zone, your, you know, the, the location, um, the degree of slope, has to be considered when you're choosing plants, the existing plants and how you're going to work around those, how much shade they create. Um, for example, you know, which ones you're going to keep and if there are any that you are going to remove or, or um, trim back, you know, kind of taking a look at all that exposure, which direction does this face, how much sunlight is it getting, um, that will all be important when you're choosing plants for the site. And um, how much wind, you know, if you've got a high bluff where you've got a lot of wind, um, you might want to be careful about choosing, for example, birch trees, which tend to do well in ice storms, but um, oddly don't do well in high winds sometimes. So, um, and then the plant hardiness zone, which you can find on the web as well, just like I did, but that's, that's the map of the zones um, in Maine and, um, and it is quite variable and interesting. So, we sort of have a wide range um, all in one state. So, and then I highlighted here striped maple because it is great on slopes. Um, it's an understory tree, so it's, it's um, shade tolerant. You can plant it underneath a big oak. It can get fairly big, but it tends to generally stay as a as sort of a big shrub. Has beautiful lined bark. And then at this time of year, it starts to turn yellow. Um, so I think it's pretty um, attractive and provides some seasonal variability as a planting. Oops. Ah. I'll figure this out eventually. Probably by the time we're done, I'll know what I'm doing. Um, so the plantings, you know, how will you go about it? Will you create beds or are you adding plant material, sort of point planting, like you're taking what's already there and just putting in a new striped maple or two. Um, 
um, or were you, you know, what's your take on the natives versus non-natives? So this is an image, it's a, it's a little hard to tell the extent of it, but off to, well, it's my left, I don't know if it's your left, but off on this side is a steep bank that goes down. It's actually, this is in uh, East Booth Bay. And there's a lot of native vegetation right along the shore. It's way more than 10 feet, but probably not more than 30 feet at the widest. Um, it, and it does extend downward a ways. And she puts some Rosa Rugosa here. There's a small path and then it goes on to their, um, well, actually where I'm standing is, um, it is a shared common land kind of um, situation. So she can't plant anything in the foreground of this image. Uh, and her property starts right here. And so, and it goes back um, or their property, I should say. And so they planted, um, the, there's Rosa Ragosa here, and then they've got this path. So they, they've got sort of buffer and then a path and then more buffer and their property goes up to the house, which is up on the hill. Um, and so they've done an interesting job of, you know, sort of layers of buffer um, in different places. And that's an interesting way to think about creating the garden space. Um, and there's a lot of variability in the plantings here. And unfortunately I didn't take, I might go back to their house and take a picture of, so that this hill goes up to the house and then above the house is another hill. And on top of that hill is, is another house. And the house that's on the top of the hill, they didn't want to obstruct the view. And so they did a really interesting thing where they, it's, it's a mowed field between the two houses with the downward sloping slope um, and they took huge pieces of granite. They hired a contractor to put huge pieces of granite along in this mode area. Um, and I'd be really interested to see how it works, but they say it helps to control the water sort of like, like um, some of those uh, methods that uh, you saw on the trail where you just sort of creating a, a water bar, but with big pieces of granite. That was very interesting. Um, so with this presentation, there's, <laughs> there are a lot of resources out there and I couldn't possibly tell you all of them, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you um, a short list. I will do a follow-up email, um, later in the week with a short list of some of them. And so I didn't feel like it was really useful for me to go through and tell you all of them, but I would highlight a few. Um, this one's online. It's called the buffer handbook plant list. Um, and it's a main based um, um, document. And so uh, it's available through the main DEP. So I'll give you the link for that. It's also here on this, on this slideshow, but um, I will send that along to you as well as one of the options. And then, you know, another part of it is how do you access native plants in particular? Um, it's, it's uh, you know, you can just go out in the woods and dig them up, but then you're removing them from a place where presumably they're providing some service there as well. So um, we really encourage people to use um, the Wild Seed Project, which is a nonprofit based in Portland, Maine. And they, first of all, have a ton of information on their website about how to plant things um, and where to get plants. And they do have this where to buy native plants list that's quite up to date. And it has garden clubs and um, uh, companies listed there and uh, a number of other, other resources. And they themselves are a great source for seed. Um, and and I've, I've bought seed from them as pretty successful. So I encourage you to check out, check out their options. And, and again, and they have a lot of information about um, even things like if you wanna go out and collect wild seed, um, on your own and use that to populate your buffer um, that they'll have information on that on this website that will help you do that. Oops. So that is kind of what I had for you, but I certainly want to um, entertain any conversation that you have about maybe specifically about your own sites and questions you might have um, based on what we talked about.
Yeah, so I have a question. Um, in addition to all these wonderful resources and um, this presentation, which is great, I've learned a lot that I think I can use. Do you, uh, or could you recommend an individual who can do an on-site consultation? Yep, so I, through Lake Smart, I am doing um, on-site consultations of sorts. Um, and Lake Smart, um, we call it Lake Smart Start when I kind of do a, a consultation. And Lake Smart, you, if you if you go through all the um, the hoops, um, you, you get an award at the end uh, if you if your property meets standards. But um, but I am happy to come out and and offer what I can. Um, there are other people as well, especially in the realm of uh, native plants and um, and um, I don't know, you know, let's see, the Knox Soil and Water Conservation District, um, they certainly have resources there. And I don't know the specifics of what they can offer, but that would be one place. And then Cooperative Extension is another place that you can certainly go for um, support and ideas about everything from, you know, soil tests to planting ideas. Um, landscaping concepts, that sort of thing. So I'll include both of those agencies in the contact information that I sent to the follow-up email, because those are important. They're, they have a lot on the web, but it might be worth calling the offices and, and talking to people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Oh, Sarah, you're, you're muted, but you look like you might be talking. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's Good. great. <laughs> uh, I um, actually live right next door to Virginia Pardo's uh, property, and we are um, on the on the river. Hi, Virginia. <laughs> We're on the river where there, at least in one of the yards, there was a former brickyard, and I've where the soil has eroded away there a lot of bricks coming out of the soil surface. And I just, I'm debating whether to dig those all up or leave them there and put soil over them, or I don't know how deep they go, but they're a lot of <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah. And your reason for wanting to move them is just so you can plant more easily? Is that what I'd you're like thinking? I'd like to plant like blueberries. It's un under oak trees and pine trees and yeah i'd like to bring in native uh plants and right now it's well it's just very unfriendly to planting anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can see that would be um complicated um how how dense are is there any soil mixed in or is it pretty dense with yeah, yeah there, bricks yes there's a lot there's a lot of clay soil oh. there is clay soil and um it's just that it's been worn down over the years we had a influx of uh, a huge flocks of canada geese for a while and now they're gone but um they wore the they ate up all the vegetation and wore the soil down uh and the bricks started appearing everywhere <laughs> so um <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting so there yeah. there is clay uh, soil all around. Yeah. How would you remove them? That would be complicated. Yeah, I think probably I just have to, I haven't really started to try and to yeah. see how dense they are and, you know, how much soil I need to replace if I do take them out. So I think I've got to do a little more experimentation. Yeah, I guess I don't fully know the, the answer to that. Um, I, I guess it, it would depend is my, <laughs> my guess. And yes, what I, you, what I you understand find. you wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not we'll sure. Have you, we'll have you over sometime and I'd, um, I'd love to walk the shore all, there. All sure. Um, I will say the buffer <laughs> okay. is a great idea given the geese issue. Um, geese are contributing more and more waste into the water and they're on the shores a lot and they do become a source of pollution when their populations get significant like this and so um planting mm -hmm. planting buffers are th that's the best way to 
control their populations because they simply won't nest in those areas. So. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So you'll you'll be that's doing great. doubly, triply useful work. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Good. Didn't realize there was a brickyard there ever. So that's an interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They, we, you know, we didn't know it either until these bricks started appearing all around. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one other thing that's happening is that I didn't mention this earlier, but we do have these deluge rains as well that are these, you know, um, well, it used to be that there were, you know, light rains every evening or so in July and August, and they would soak into the soil. But now that we have climate change, the patterns are a bit different. And we tend to have no rain, no rain, and then an inch and a half of rain, and then no rain, no rain, no rain, no rain, and then two inches of rain. And that has exasperated some of these issues that you're talking about because um, the grass gets very, in the vegetation of any kind, gets very dry, you know, in the summer, and then it gets so well packed by geese or whatever, <laughs> it's just drying out that when you do get that two inches of rain, well, it all just flows directly into the water, picking up whatever's along the soil, and it doesn't have a chance to infiltrate. So, um, mm -hmm. and in fact, I mean, that's, the, the oyster growers are actually documenting changes in, um, in the estuary that, you know, changes in nitrogen um, resulting from those deluge rains. It's a, it's a very specific event that is that is emerging. So. Oh, interesting. Uh, well, we'll send a follow-up um, email. And if there's anything else that people want to discuss, I'm happy to. Or if um, you would like. Um, even just sending photographs sometimes is, is helpful. So you're welcome to, you know, send me a photograph of your bank and say, what do you think? And if it's not just bricks, which I don't know much about, then I might be able to help. 